Hello and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review for House of the Dragon Season 2. In this video I will review uh, Season 2 of House of the Dragon as a whole. So if you have not seen all of Season 2 of House of the Dragon you will not want to watch this video otherwise some things will be spoiled for you. So the first thing I'll say about Season 2 of House of the Dragon overall is that I love this show. It is so good. Like, so there's this feeling I get when I really, really love a show, and I haven't gotten this feeling since Game of Thrones was good. So Game of Thrones season six, <laughs> I haven't had this feeling, and I had it with Game of Thrones. I had it with Lost. It's where I'm so like in love with the show, waiting a week for the next episode is like going through heroin withdrawals where I'm just like I can't wait for the next episode and it was even worse is waiting in between seasons and I'm like I can't wait and I hadn't had this since um since Game of Thrones season six and uh, I didn't really have it with House of the Dragon season one maybe a little bit but this season I was definitely way more into and there's a reason for it because the acting is amazing the character stories are great I'm so involved I'm so invested with the world the way they draw out the characters the way they develop them the way the changes that they make from the book are usually really interesting and very good and I haven't had any complaints about it like i've heard some other book readers apparently are like up in arms about certain things such as rainier and allison meeting and um damon having the vision of the game of thrones there and stuff like that and that stuff the allison stuff i actually love i actually think is great or like the mishandling uh, or what they call mishandling of blood and cheese that is turning it down a bit. I thought that was brilliant. Um, I think they needed to turn it down. So um, I disagree with people who are upset with that. So a lot of the things that I've heard certain book readers complain about, I had no issue with. And in fact, in some cases, loved. And so this season has gotten pretty much everything right down to character stories to how the stories are the written how they're developed acting uh, special effects like the battle sequence with the with the dragons it has been freaking visual it's a visual feast absolutely amazing acting visual effects music like everything has been hit 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 except for one thing um, there's only one thing that they got wrong this season and unfortunately it's a very important thing it's a very very big thing so unfortunately it does hurt what otherwise would have been such an amazing season it does hurt it quite a bit and that is the pacing and it actually makes it more frustrating to me because the show is so good that the characters are so good and what we see happens is so good it makes it more frustrating that they got the pacing so wrong and they dragged out far too many things and the bigger point is is that they didn't um they left the last half of the season just was just a giant tease for season seven i or for season three sorry jumping the gun for season three and i heard um someone refer to the season finale as a 70 minute trailer for season three and i don't think that's too inaccurate now and here's the thing if, if you compare it to Game of Thrones, I'll just use Game of Thrones in the, as an example for obvious reasons, but this would apply for pretty much every show, every good show anyway, every well-structured show, is that they always have a major event happen towards the end of the season. Um, like Game of Thrones typically did in episode 9, but sometimes they'd also have stuff in the finale that would be big as well. Like in season 1, you know, the big event is Ned, Ned Stark being beheaded, but there's also Daenerys hatching her dragons in the finale. Season 2, you had the Battle of Blackwater, but then in the finale you also had like Theon getting, losing Winterfell and, um, and in season three, you had the, of course, the Red Wedding, and but the finale sort of uh, dealt with the aftermath of it in a really huge way. And season four's 
like had many big events throughout the season, which is why it's my favorite season of Game of Thrones, to the Purple Wedding, to uh, Tyrion's trial, uh, the trial by combat, to um, the battle at the wall, and then the finale was just Boom, 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 the Brienne Hound fight, the freaking Tyrion killing Tywin. It was like boom, 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 boom. So that's how like good seasons of television are structured. You have this release. It has it leaves a lot open, like for the next season. There's definitely a lot of like um, setting up for the next season involved and that to get you pumped to come back. But it gives you a release, it gives you satisfaction, it gives you a payoff towards the end of the season that was lacking here. And I'm sorry, that is a major thing. Now, I won't get into spoilers for those who haven't read the books, so don't worry. But before the season started, there were several events that I was predicting that would happen. Um, so... There's some major events. The so the the season started really well. It was hitting all the beats and it was going at a good pace because you got the blood and cheese in episode one right off the ba- right out of the gate. They didn't wait for they didn't dilly daddy. First episode blood and cheese, and then second episode was the Eric and Arik fight, which some may argue wasn't such a huge thing, but it was I think an important beat from the book, and I love the way it was portrayed in the show. Um, and then episode three kind of was your lull, was your setup and setting the stage like Darren goes to, uh, Damon goes to Heron Hall and, and you're setting the stage and you get the Rainier and Allison meeting, which again, I liked and I didn't have an issue with. So that's fine. You need one sort of setup episode in the middle of the season. That's a normal thing. So that's fine. And then episode four, of course, the battle of Rook's rest was completely amazing. Problem is, the next four episodes, we only get one major event, the Red Sewing, which I had predicted would happen in episode five. I don't think there's any reason why it shouldn't have happened in episode five, but they waited till the penultimate episode of the season and then made the season finale just a huge giant setup for the next season so as much as i like the red sewing and i thought that was amazing i thought that episode was absolutely amazing one of my favorite episodes of the season it was not like the huge payoff that you needed it was even though it was amazing and i loved it it was essentially set up it was setting up that hey we're giving these dragons to these new guys but it wasn't the big payoff. <laughs> it was, so I don't count it as a big payoff. I think it should have happened earlier in the season. And so there are two events, which I will not name because I will not give spoilers because they haven't happened in the show yet, but I will call them event A and event B. So it be, it, some people were complaining that event A didn't happen this season, but I think it, I caught on fairly early on like around episode four that they weren't going to have time to do event a now in the books event a happens before event b but here's the thing i was convinced because the show has done certain book events out of order already like in season one um when um when uh, luke died uh, in the books, like Damon went to Heron Hall first before that happened, and he was there when Blooded and Cheese happened. But in the show, they changed the order of events, and they did that. They did that several times. So I had assumed or predicted that that's what they would do this time, that um, they would have event B happen before event A, and they would save event A for season three, but then do event B. Well, they would end the season with event B because I had predicted like two years ago when season one finished that they would end the season with event B because that would be the perfect way to end the season. Um, Those who have read the books probably know what I'm talking about, but that would have been the perfect way to end the season. So I was expecting even 
when I got up to the finale, I think there was definitely could have been a way that they pulled off event B in the finale. And I heard read like so called leaks, which apparently are false, <laughs> but I've read these leaks that said event B would happen in the finale. So I was like waiting for it. I was like, it better fucking happen. And it didn't. Now, maybe when I see season three, I'll be like, oh no, I understand why they needed to push event both these events A and B back because they needed proper time to set up for it. And event A is a huge would be a huge budget killer. And so that doesn't surprise me that they pushed that back to season three. But event B, even though it happened after event A in the books, isn't such a budget killer and they definitely could have done it without too much of a worry. And they could have just switch swapped the order of events, which they've already done. But uh so now that they're saving them both this season three, I think they won't swap the order of events. But here's the thing. <laughs> it's it kind of makes the whole season a little bit of a failure that they didn't do event B um by the end of the season, or any major event by the end of the season, that they just shoved everything off. And and so it makes so season one they talked about is the setup, it was the prequel, it was like the backstory, the history, and they go through it at a very fast pace, and there's time jumps, in fact they don't even develop, take as much time as they need to develop, like adult versions of Eamon, Jason, and Aegon and stuff like that, they just go through it very quick. And then, so, and they were saying at the end of season one that, oh, yeah, no, but it's all out war. We're getting into the war now. And then we get season two, and then the showrunner's like, oh, this is just the, the march to war. I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> it, season two was supposed to be all out war. And now they're saying, oh, season three is going to be all out war. And season two was just the cold war and just the all out war. Now, here's the thing, and I've heard some people defend um, the pacing. And saying that, oh, we need the character set up. We need the character development. Don't get me wrong. If you understand, if you know my stance on season seven and eight of Game of Thrones, you know how I feel about the dangers of moving too fast and not doing proper character development and proper character setup and just wanting to hit one epic event after another without developing the characters or without having a focus on the characters and that's why those two seasons were an utter failure um so don't get me wrong i'm not i know the importance of character development i love that we got a lot of dialogue heavy scenes i love the scenes where people two people in the room talking don't misunderstand me and i love how they develop the characters but there was a lot of scenes in the season that were filler. There were a lot of storyline that dragged on for far too long that you didn't need to spend that much time. Uh, chief among them is Damon's storyline. Um, you did not, like, they could have done that in, like, three episodes, maybe even two episodes. We'll have him show up the Heron Hall and have another episode of him, the Visions, and then another episode of a Vision, and then uh, in that same episode you can have him bend the knee to Renera. You didn't need to push that back to the finale. We got six episodes of him having crazy Visions, and... Um, <laughs> you didn't need that much. It was useless visions like him sleeping with his mother. Uh, that was a waste of time and just weird. Like, you definitely don't need to have that there. And, um, there was, I remember in episode six, he had a vision and I was like, okay, so now he's going to be devoted to Renair. Definitely now, uh, this, that vision totally convinced him of seeing, uh, where he had a couple visions of Viserys and he was saying that he imagining what it would have been like if he was at his um you know helped him or consoled him after his wife died so i was like okay so now he realizes it's going to be devoted to renair and then the next episode we get yet another vision of uh, viserys and this time he making it clear that oh you don't want this throne you don't want the crown you don't want the throne and i was like okay fine we have to. We're making it very clear now. It's extremely clear that he's going to change his mind and he's going to support Rhaenyra. And then we get yet another 
fucking vision <laughs> in the finale of him seeing the prophecies come true. And I'm like, no, that's unnecessary. You, he, you already earned. You earned it several episodes ago that he, he's going to do this character change. And now you're just beating a dead horse. And also, uh, there are several other storylines that dragged out for too long. For example, how how many scenes do we need of Rhaenyra looking out the balcony, <laughs> watching dragons fly by, or just looking out the balcony of Dragonstone and talking to my Sarier? Like, how many how many scenes of that do we actually need? How many scenes do we need of her saying, "Oh, I don't want to kill people. Oh, I don't want to start a war." Um, she should have realized in the earlier part of the season, like particularly at the Battle of Rook's Rest, by then you should know you are in all-out war. Killing people is part of war. And yet they dragged it out over and over and over again. And speaking of stuff that dragged out, Corliss's ship was being worked on for the entire season. Corliss did absolutely nothing this season other than stand by his ship and talk to people while his ship was being worked on. Every single episode was just scenes of him standing in the docks talking to people. And as I said, again, do not misunderstand me that I love the talky scenes, I love the character development scenes, uh, I love the character story they did with Corliss this season with his, um, you know, dealing with his two bastard sons and uh, how he's having to acknowledge them more and more. Uh, and I love the payoff with Alan in the finale. But they, they dragged on for way too long. They had way too much development. It was overkill. And it, I'm sorry, many of the scenes were unnecessary and filler. And on the note of stuff that dragged on for too long, there was uh, Reyna. Uh, they telegraphed it pretty early on that she was upset with having to being sent off to look after the kids and she wanted to be more involved. She saw the dragon in the veil, so she's going to get a dragon. And they dragged it out, dragged it out, dragged it out to the point where she doesn't even get the dragon by the end of the season, which is how, <laughs> why do you need to drag that out that long so on top of that <laughs> uh you just had a lot of scenes with like allison that dragged her like do we need to see her going in the in the woods and, and floating around uh, do we need all these scenes with her talking to kristen cole in fact for that matter did we even need the affair between her and kristen cole that seems in entirely and completely pointless and every time they went back to that storyline i felt like it was a waste of time there were so many things that could have been cut, that could have been condensed to, in order to give the season a more satisfying conclusion, in order to not make it feel like, because I think this is an important thing, pacing is an important thing, and this is a problem with a lot of modern day shows and films, is that they don't give like a proper payoff this happens so many times and i complain about it every time they don't give a proper payoff by the end of the season they just like oh we'll come back next season and then you'll get the payoff which is not it's not how you make a good show it's not how you keep an audience uh and if this season had 10 episodes and uh they were able to do two more episodes to complete, to have that satisfying conclusion, then I'm all for. You can have Damon have Vision six episodes in a row. You can have um, <laughs> uh, Rhaenyra constantly looking out the balcony or Corliss standing by his ship being fixed. Like, it took forever for them to fix that goddamn ship. But <laughs> you can have that as long as the last episode or the last two episodes they actually do something, and you actually pay it off. The fact that they just ended the season with a montage of, oh, this is what's coming, is bullshit because it's all set up, basically, and no payoff. And that is not how you make a good season. And this is so frustrating because the season is so good. The story is so good. I am so invested in the story. But the fact that I am so invested, the fact that I love these characters, the fact that I love the story makes it all the more frustrating 
that they do not pay it off this season. It just makes it that more, much more um, disappointing and, and infuriating <laughs> that because the show is so good except for that one thing and that one thing unfortunately is very very important <sighs> but anyway <laughs> so some people i've heard some people and they've heard it from sources like um online some like ilio uh, what's his face who helped write the world of ice and fire like he was saying that hbo cut it was hbo's fault because they cut back or at least this is what i heard that they cut back um the 10 episodes to eight episodes after the scripts were already written and because of the writer's strike they didn't have time to restructure it however i don't believe this because for one thing, Ryan Condal is going around saying that he struck, he purposely structured season two this way. That they looked ahead, they saw that they were going to have four seasons, and they purpose he purposely structured this, and he gave some budgetary reasons. As I said, event A would be too much, too expensive, and they would blow the budget, so they had to save it for season three which i understand but as i said you could have brought an event b forward if you were going to do that but uh <laughs> but you need to do something at the end of the season if you're not going to do event a you need to do something else because it needs to be some payoff but um but um yeah so he was saying that uh but he purposely laid out the seasons and this is exactly the pacing that he wanted so that seems to go against and plus the House of the Dragon was filming during the writer's strike, so that actually, to me, that doesn't fit because the HBO would cut back on the number of episodes right before filming began. I, I just don't... It just doesn't go along with everything that is the, how it's building, so I actually don't buy that. Uh, it, I don't buy that, oh, they had planned 10 episodes and they were going to pay off this thing in 10 episodes because this goes against what Ryan Condal is saying. But even, so, so people are like, oh, be upset with HBO and not the showrunners. No, I'm sorry, I'm going to be upset with both because here's the thing. I'm not so upset about cutting back from 10 episodes to 8 episodes. There is an easy way, there is such a is plausible way that they could have hit these events and told a satisfying story in eight episodes it is so doable it is so doable to do it in eight episodes because as i said they had all this filler all this stretching out st of storylines that they could have easily cut back on to have a more satisfying conclusion and still do it in eight episodes the 10 episode eight episode thing people are complaining about that i don't think that's an issue I think the way they structured the season, regardless of how many episodes they have, that's the issue. But anyway, so let me jump into some of the specifics of the season. Uh, the specific storylines, which I actually really liked, because Rhaenyra, um, she didn't have that clear of a storyline. Um, it was mainly about like her counsel. They were making it clear that they're hindering her, that they don't believe in her, and they're constantly arguing with her. You had Alfred Broom, who's constantly trying to undermine her, even when she sent him to make sure Damon didn't try to rebel. He instead tried to push Damon to do the very thing he was sent to stop him from doing. And then the other Keltigar guy, who was like complaining and yelling about every single thing that she was doing and to the point where she had to slap him and i actually thought that was that was so satisfying to see him be slapped like that uh and also you get a sense of frustration from Rhaenyra about not being able to actually go into battle on how she really wanted to ride her dragon and she didn't like the fact that all these people were dying for her and she couldn't go out and do it um 
and how that also boils over to Jace because she was imposing that same restrictions on Jace because she didn't want to lose her heir and so he got frustrated and he would sneak out to do diplomacy like all teenagers do <laughs> and uh, how she, you know, she was upset about that and the two of them were like fractured when she decided to have bastards riding dragons because she realized that they needed more dragons and this had a personal issue with Jace, but I do like how Jace came together by the end of the season and and supported her where he was being not that supportive of her throughout the season. And so that was kind of a satisfying arc. Um, now then, Damon, as much as I think that arc absolutely should have been condensed 100%, it was still a good arc. Um, it was clear from how he was portrayed in season one that he was reckless didn't really care about anyone but his own and that he butt heads with Rhaenyra when she was pissed off with him for doing the blood and cheese thing <laughs> which she had every right to be pissed off because it, it tarnishes her name and hurts her cause and so she had that um, argument with him and of course he got pissed off because he feels like that he should be the king so he go, runs off the Heron Hall which is like a spooky haunted castle <laughs> that gives him lots of weird visions and he meets the witch Alice who even like fucks with his head and gives him weird shit to drink <laughs> and he starts to realize through these visions that he um that ruling is actually not his destiny it's not what he really would want to do because and we see that through the actions of what he goes through by um telling the blackwoods to like murder and kidnap uh bracken civilians and children uh and that blows up on his face and the river lords to refuse to support him because of that he realizes that he wouldn't be good at ruling because he's not good at diplomacy that he's good at war and so that's what he should stick to and and uh, as much as i think they really should have could have condensed the visions the seeing the Viserys making it very clear like you don't want to rule this is weighed heavily on me and this and he realizes not a thing to be one um and so by the time Rhaenyra shows up he completely devotes to her and realizes that she's the one who's good at ruling she's the one who's good at diplomacy he's good at war so that's what he's going to do and he's going to support her full tilt and i think you absolutely did need this character story and this character development so i think it works for the show very much but it just will reassert it did not need to be this long speaking of storylines that were good but didn't need to be that long it was corliss um it's very interesting seeing him um, with uh, his wife at the start of the season. We got a little, a lot of great scenes and how much they trusted each other. And it was interesting that the last conversation they had before she died was that he shouldn't be hiding his bastard sons. He should be upholding them and supporting them because it's not their fault of their birth even though he's obviously feels very ashamed and guilty about uh, having bastards um but then so she passes away and he's like very d depressed obviously and upset and uh Bela talks some sense into him and saying uh that look she wanted to put Rhaenyra on the throne so I'm gonna make sure that's done and that's what you can do to honor her and so he goes out of his way to honor her and says it's for her that she does it for and she he tries to get closer to his sons um particularly Alan, who uh, is saved his life at sea and is a very good seller, so promotes him to the first mate. And um, also, his other son Adam becomes a dragon rider, so he, he starts to reconsider the fact that maybe I shouldn't have ignored these bastards. But when he's trying to be helpful to Alan, Alan blows up in his face and points it out to him flat out of how he. Uh, hard it was for him to grow up how he could barely survive he couldn't barely had that he had to work 12 hours a day just to eat enough to feed himself while he saw Corliss and his true born sons and daughters uh living the life in luxury and he had no idea what it's like but the thing is Corliss 
you could tell that he was feeling guilty. He did tell um, Alan several times that he was dismissed, but he could have been way more harsh. He could have threatened to, uh, you know, uh, kick him off, to have him disbarred or whatever. Um, but he didn't do that. Instead, he just stood there and took it because he knew that that uh, that Alan had every right to feel that way. So that was a very good story. Um, I think it, again, didn't need to be that long. <laughs> we don't need that many scenes of them standing by a boat talking. But anyway, um, Bella and Raina also had an interesting storyline. I already talked about how they dragged Raina's storyline out far too long. But it was still, if they condensed it, it would have been perfectly fine. Uh, Bella, I love this character. I actually want to see more of her. Uh, I like her interactions with Jace. I love how she talked sense into Jace towards the end of the season and convinced them to support Rhaenyra. And she talked sense into Corliss, too. She seems very wise. And then she gave a zinger to Alfred, who was like, well, next time you're on your dragon, maybe you can do that, <laughs> which I love. So she has a great character. It's just, uh, I actually wanted to see more of her. I think they, they underutilized her as opposed to these other characters they dragged on for too long. So then we get the dragon seeds, Hugh and um, uh, Ulf, who they set up uh, in King's Landing, which I appreciated, although again could have condensed this especially <laughs> all the Ulf stuff but that's all good it shows Ulf if we get it he's a, a drunkard who's like a good old fella and who <laughs> claims to be a Targaryen bastard and then there's Hugh who his storyline is a bit more tragic who is promised money from the king but the king gets burned and so <laughs> this never pays off on this and his daughter dies from starvation and he is at so much at the end of the rope he's willing to risk his life uh which he'll probably will die to go get a dragon uh and this is another thing i wish we would have seen more of these characters particularly after they got the dragon how they convert i wonder Hugh didn't even mention his wife in the final episode um which i don't get the impression that he left her i think that they are still together because he even promised to make her lady so i wonder if they're going to address that but i have to wait two years to see that and Ulf, i think they could have toned down his over-the-top behavior in the finale just a tad because he was being too disrespectful and too over the top but definitely keep the fact that he's a drunkard and doesn't know how to act in court but just tone it down just a tad that's just my opinion but i i want i wanted to see more both of these characters and i hope we get more development with them in the future now going over to the green sides allison's storyline yeah it wasn't really that good i mean i think you got key moments such as um Eamon when he took over um, how he fired her and how this completely destroys her. Like, she's trying to hold Aemon and Aegon back from, like, de killing everyone and destroying the realm. Um, but she was actually was fairly successful in doing this with Aegon. But with Aemon, it was, he had none of it and just fired her. And, of course, with Aegon, he, she was being a bad mother to him and saying that he should just shut up and do nothing. And then so he goes out and his dragon and gets himself nearly killed uh, because she made him feel bad. Uh, and then, of course, she gets, like, really depressed about sleeping with Chris and Cole while her, um her grandson was murdered and so distracting Chris and Cole from doing his job uh, but still sleeps with him again but then is just gets into the depressed phase and goes off and and goes to the forest which again all of this could have been condensed like a lot but I did really unlike some book readers as I said I love the scene at the end of the uh, season where I just think it shouldn't have been at the end of the season. I think the finale of the season would have made a really great penultimate episode or two episodes left. Uh, but I still really love the scene where she went to Rhaenyra. It was so well acted. It was so intense. It was so well written. And I totally buy that she would be willing to give up King's Landing 
uh, for Rhaenyra because she was so been so unhappy her whole life. And like it really paid off her storyline throughout the whole show about how uh, her whole life she was just being pushed and pressured by her father into doing things and she never really took agency. Now she's finally taking agency back and saying, I, I don't want a part of any of this, you know, Game of Thrones, <laughs> to coin a phrase, of this playing, you know, this power game. I don't want any part of it. I just want to go off and do my own thing so you can have King's Landing. And that conversation between them was great. But again, could have gotten there a lot, a lot faster. Um... As for Kristen Cole, easily the most hated uh, character in the show, uh, and that for good reason. And and so it gets so frustrating. He comes up, particularly at the start of the season, he came off as a huge ass fucking hypocrite because he was sleeping around instead of doing his job, and then he berates Arik for no good reason, just to take his anger out and forces Arik on this suicide mission that will obviously get him killed. And uh, and so he's scum, and he goes off and. And you know, kills people for supporting Renair and cuts off their head. It's it, he's like, yeah, very despicable. But his whole affair with Alicent was I could not give a shit about, and I really think that um, it was unnecessary, and that it, they could have cut it out entirely, and you would miss nothing. Um, and the fact of he him getting PTSD after the big dragon battle was interesting but i think they dragged it out for too long um and i have a hard time again it's because this character is so hated i have a hard time finding sympathy for him but it does make sense that he would be so shocked about uh the horrors that he saw i did like the idea of it i just think they overdid it now as far as aemon goes um, some people are complaining that he's coming off as a two-dimensional villain, a mustache twirly villain, and I think they are definitely pushing him that way, but I think they're doing it in the way that's believable for his character, they're definitely making it add up from the fact that he was constantly bullied as a kid, and the fact that Aegon bullied him at the brothel, uh, even as an adult, and then the very next day, uh, Aemon goes and, and <laughs> basically tries to kill him, kind of shows that, yeah, Aegon is not the smartest cookie for doing that, and it's also showing just how much he resents the way he was treated, but it also ironically shows that he's not a good leader, because when he does become king regent he doesn't listen to anyone he just barks orders around and makes some really dumb moves uh and he's more about bloodlust and he's not uh again won't listen to his mother when she has very wise advice uh the one smart thing he did do was try to get Otto hightower back to be his hand but unfortunately as we found at the end of the season Otto hightower is being held in a cell where by whom no clue no idea anyway because the show doesn't give us any fucking payoff uh, but yeah of course the battle of brooks rest rook's rest was very very interesting um with it was great seeing the dragon action with uh vagar um and him attacking Aegon was a change from the book and it, it was really surprising but i think it does make a lot of sense for this character now as for Aegon himself uh this was an interesting storyline as well because it, the last season it showed that he didn't want the throne but now uh he started out like really wanting it and he let the sort of power go to his head and he was sick of uh auto constantly telling him what to do and pushing him down so he stripped away the hand of the king and gave it to Kristen cole which was a very bad very bad move it shows that he was definitely not a good king either uh because Kristen cole immediately went out into battle so that's not his role to be a hand of the king uh that's not the kind of person you want as your hand you want someone ad advising you like otto and he kind of just did that to spite him when otto uh, said that um, his father never wanted him as king, uh, which <laughs> is, cuts deep because he feels neglected by his father and by his mother. And when he went for his mother for advice, again, she neglected him more. And so he felt like he needed to prove himself in battle 
and went out and got himself burned and seeing the results of it of how he's a broken man now and he's fearing for his life because he thinks his brother is going to finish the job and so Laris sort of whisks him away which I do think is a nice little at least they gave us that payoff for his storyline this season but it was not enough to save the season so anyway my rating for House of the Dragon season 2 as a whole is going to be and eight extremely good now here's the thing with all my complaining about pacing you might think like oh an eight's pretty high but what you have to keep in mind is i was convinced throughout most of this season i was going to give it a 10 that this season was going to easily get a 10 and i was going to call it one of the best seasons of television ever but they fucked up the <laughs> they fucked up the pacing they didn't have any payoff which is so frustrating and so that does bring it down two points. It doesn't, and but it doesn't bring Ding down any lower because the fact that the pacing is off doesn't change how amazing the stuff that they did do correct was. Even though they dragged stuff out for too long, it were still satisfying character stories. They still paid off, and uh, in the certain ways, <laughs> they just didn't have enough of a payoff, and it felt too much. The last four episodes all felt like. They were just setting up the next season, which is not a good structure. But it was still a good show, and I'm hoping that next season... I feel like next two seasons, because they say they want to finish this show in four seasons, the next two seasons have to go faster in order for them to get to the end by season four, especially if they're only eight episodes per season. They're going to have to pick up the pace, just point blank they won't have a choice so uh, and unless they stretch it out to five seasons but he's still the showrunner still insists there will be four so the season three and four must be quicker in order for them to get to the ending so i am looking forward to the seasons but it's two years away so i'm gonna have to kind of turn off my brain or not turn off the side of my thinking of this story at all because otherwise i'll just get too impatient that's what i did in between seasons one and two <laughs> and i'll go read duncan egg and get ready for the night of the seven kingdoms next year uh to hold me over and try to forget about this show um otherwise it's just gonna be too much of a withdrawal <laughs> But yeah, when we get back in two years, I'll turn my love for the show back on. And then I am convinced that the next two seasons will be better. But who knows? This season disappointed me, so I could be disappointed again, but hopefully not. Anyway, that is it for my review of House of the Dragon Season 2. Thanks so much for watching this video. Uh, you can check out all the videos I've done on every episode of House of the Dragon Season 2 as well as doing a live discussion on much more detailed on every episode. And I also recently did a discussion for those who have read the books. I gave my predictions for Season 3 along with my guests. We discussed the possibilities of Season 3 and 4 uh, according to the book. So if you have read the books, definitely check that out. I'll put a link to that in the description below and thank you so much for watching be sure to check out my channel as i cover other shows particularly star trek covering star trek next generation and deep space nine one episode at a time and uh yeah check out my channel for many other videos or many other shows as well so be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that and thanks a lot for watching